known as described as an isolated cell inside the frontal sinus. This is an isolated cell inside the frontal sinus. Otherwise, any cell like type 3 going above the 50% of the height of the frontal sinus is the type 4 cell. So, this is the most difficult one as with the endoscope you can't access this cell very easily and sometimes you need to have a long instruments like 120 degree debrider, the other uh, latest gadgets which can take you high up to this and if you can't you have to drill the interior wall of the frontal sinus or you can you may have to do a modified lathrop or sometimes an open approach to remove this cell completely because unless this cell is not removed completely there will be obstruction behind and persistent sinusitis. So this is type 4 cell. Now these were the anterior group of cells occupying the anterior part. Now the another group is the cells occupying the posterior part from behind and obliterating the frontal sinus out. So out of them the simplest is the suprabullar cell. We know the bulla is most of the time attached to the skull base. Sometimes bulla doesn't extend to the skull base and there are number of cells above it which compromise the posterior part of the frontal sinus drainage sometimes it's big and completely blocks the frontal sinus so now the difference unlike to the frontal cells they are attached behind to the posterior wall this is skull base behind is the cranium you can't go behind the cell if you try to go behind you'll enter the intracranial cavity so this should this fact should be very very clearly under, understood by means of a sagittal ct scan that where the cell is attached and one should not attempt going behind this cell otherwise we may have an, an accidental intracranial entry. So to remove this cell the interior wall has to be punctured and cells should be removed in a piecemeal manner to remove it completely. Like this cell you can't go behind it you have to open the interior wall and remove the cell completely to clear the frontal recess. So this what, whether it is a frontal cell or a suprabullar cell it is best understood by the sagittal section of CT scan. That's why the three-dimensional CT is imperative for a proper endoscopic sinus surgery procedure. Now, if what happens, this suprabullar cell, if happens to extend inside the frontal sinus, further obliterating the outflow of the frontal recess, this becomes more difficult now. It's going high up, and again we have to understand this is attached to the posterior wall. We don't need to go behind, and we have to open the anterior wall and remove it completely to accomplish the frontal recess drainage. So this should be understood by the CT scan. So this is the frontal buller cell. The frontal buller cell extending inside the frontal sinus attached to the posterior wall unlike the frontal cells which are attached to the anterior wall. Now another is a supraorbital cell. This is a very common entity. What happens this this is not unlike the supra uh, buller cell this cell is more anterior towards the just behind the frontal sinus opening and further this cell nematizes the upper part of the orbit and compromise the frontal sinus opening. We will see a case today with the supraorbital cell. This compromises the frontal sinus outflow by occupying the interior part of the frontal sinus and you can see on the CT scan how this compromises the uh, frontal sinus. So this look on endoscopic picture how does it look like when you see the frontal sinus opening you will see the two openings so whenever there are two openings or any doubt of the frontal sinus you have two guide number one whichever is the medial opening is the true frontal sinus and second is you palpate the beak of the frontal bone and just underneath the beak whichever cell is just underneath the beak is the frontal sinus we will see in the life surgical fashion so this is the supraorbital cell looks like in a Sagittal section and the coronal section. See the lateral cell. Oh, see this is the frontal sinus normal on the other side. This is the frontal sinus blocked laterally and posteriorly by the supraorbital cell. Looking bigger than the frontal sinus proper. Another is the intersinus septal cell. See what happens. If you see this coronal picture, this line diagram, the frontal recess, opposite frontal recess would be here and the medial part of the frontal recess drainage is occupied by a cell that is intersinus septal cell occupies the medial drainage of the frontal sinus. This cell opens in either of the frontal sinus whichever and see this is the intersinus cell. This is opening into this sinus and blocking the outflow of this sinus like this and we need to understand and communicate this to the 
corresponding frontal sinus to for, for a proper drainage of the frontal vessel. Now, see the difference what we have discussed on the same coronal scan. This is the cell, what it can be and this is the cell, what it can be. These are two different cells and you can't differentiate on a coronal scan 100 percent. To understand this fact, you can't differentiate whether it is an anterior group of cell or a posterior group of cell. So, to understand this fact, if we have a sagittal reconstruction, see this is attached to the anterior wall. So, it is a Kuhn type 3 cell and this cell is attached to the posterior wall. So, it is a frontobular cell. This is how the coronal CT is important to differentiate. Now, most important landmark is seen every under endoscopic sinus surgery procedure is which you comes across you all the time is the middle terminate. Middle terminate is a constant landmark and very important in the sense see the middle turbinate you can see on the any coronal CT scan it has three portions the first second third uh, we'll see and it divides the second part divides the anterior from the posterior model cells and the way the middle turbinate is attached in three dimension it gives stability to this ethmoidal labyrinth we'll see see the first part of the middle turbinate what we see this is the first part this is attached in a sagittal plane see the three parts the first part it is attached in a sagittal plane above anteriorly it is attached to the frontal nasal process of the maxilla and posteriorly it goes high up and attached to the junction of the lateral and medial lamella of the cribriform this is a very very important thing we need to understand as this middle part of the middle turbinate should be handled with caution any forceful manipulation to this portion of the middle turbinate can give rise to a distant CSF leak at the level of the cribriform plate. The second part of the middle turbinate lies in a coronal plane and it goes laterally and attached to the lamina papyracea known as basal lamella or ground lamella. On the third part of the middle turbinate, the part behind we will see goes behind and attached to the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone. So, and that lies in the axial portion. So, this middle turbinate is a three dimensional structure. See now on CT scan one by one. The first part of the middle turbinate attached to the cribriform, the lateral lamella and medial lamella attached to the junction of the lateral and medial lamella. The second part, see how it is turning to atta get attached laterally to the lamina papyracea and divides anterior. These are the anterior ethmoidal cells anterior to it and are the posterior ethmoidal cell posterior and superior to it. And this is the third part of the middle turbinate attached to the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone in the posterior most part in the roof of the coina. So, this is the third part of the middle turbinate lying in the axial plane. So, sometimes it may has also have variations like paradoxically bent. See the middle turbinate is generally, generally bent like this. This is paradoxically bent and this situation compromises the osteometal area and can give rise to further sinusitis and this has to be corrected by a lamellar resection. We will see. This is the uh, paradoxically bent. Sometimes it is not the turbinate itself, but the, the lamella of the turbinate is pneumatized and can give rise to uh, blockage of the air flow to the other sinuses. This is known as interlamellar cell of Grunewald. This is the pneumatization of the lamella of the middle turbinate not the proper middle turbinate which is known as conchabulosa. So, after the middle turbinate the next structure behind is the superior turbinate we can appreciate this is the posterior ethmoid area see how the shape of the size of the orbit the bigger cells this is the superior turbinate and how it is attached superior it is attached superiorly to the roof of the posterior ethmoid see how thick is the roof of the posterior ethmoid even if you handle this middle turbinate cut or remove or pull it it is not going to give any problem with the skull base. The skull base here is very very thick as compared to the anterior model skull base. And this is a very very important landmark we will see in the live surgical session to approach the sphenoid sinus ostium. If the moment you enter the posterior ethmoid, it is the middle turbinate, uh, the superior turbinate which is a medial boundary of the posterior ethmoid. Posterior ethmoid is again like a box bounded laterally by the lamina papyracea and medially all the way from anterior to posterior medial limit is the superior turbinate. So, moment you reach the enter the posterior ethmoid through the gown lamella find the superior turbinate and stay medial to it stay medial to it in the front 
sphenoid model recess which will directly lead to the sphenoid sinus this is the safest way to enter the sphenoid sinus which will see in the live surgical session now come on to the come to skull base we see how the slope of the skull base is from anterior to posterior it slopes down by say 15 20 degree angle sometimes and the component of the skull base are ethmoidal roof or the fovea ethmoidal is we have a picture we will discuss that and the anterior ethmoid, anterior part of the skull is formed by the anterior ethmoidal skull base and the posterior is the posterior ethmoidal skull base we have seen the anterior ethmoidal skull base how thin it is see the anterior ethmoidal skull base how thin it is the crystal the medial lamella of the cribriform the lateral lamella see this lateral lamella it is thickened laterally this roof this thick bone laterally overlying this ethmoidal cell is the fovea ethmoidalis see we will see in the picture the uppermost ethmoidal cells are open and they are roofed by the frontal bone which is a thicker bone so, this is the frontal bone thicker bone this is roofing the uppermost ethmoidal air cells known as fovea ethmoidalis so this is the anterior part of the skull base very thin and this is the posterior part of the skull base comparatively very thick and if you see this cribriform plates the, there are various um, variety of cribriform plates you come across and keros is divided according to the uh, complicacy involved with the cribriform plates like the simplest one why complicacy i'll come on to that very shallow olfactory fossa you see very shallow less than three millimeter so in this situation if you work laterally in the frontal recess there are less chances of come in contact and hitting the lateral lamella of the cribriform. The lateral lamella is very small. This is the thinnest part of the skull base, the lateral lamella, particularly where the anterior ethmoidal artery perforates 0.05 mm. So this lateral lamella has to be cautiously dealt with as you work in the frontal recess area. If your instruments hit the lateral lamella, you can get a CSF leak. And this is a very thin lamella covered by a single layer of dura inside. Even a slightest hit to the lateral lamella will give a CSF leak. So, Kiro is divided into the shallow part, the type 1, where the lateral lamella is very small and less chances of hitting it. If it is deeper, more steep, if you are working in this area, you have more chances to hit the lateral lamella. This is type 2. And type 3, see you are working all the way here, you have a thin lamella medially and there are more chances of hitting the lateral lamella and this is Kiro's type 3 and you have to be very very cautious operating such cases. Sometimes the configuration may vary, they may be more flattened, more steep, sometimes even unequal on both sides, how this lateral lamella is, how this lateral lamella is, unequal level of the olfactory fossa. You can get any kind of situation and you need to be aware during, uh, get yourself acquainted before surgery with a uh, CT scan and this coronal section gives the better picture of this entrance model skull base. Now this is fovea what I was coming on to it. See the ethmoidal, this is ethmoidal bone. The ethmoidal bone consists of this perpendicular plate of the ethmoid forming the nasal septum in the midline. Number of tier of cells, we see the ethmoidal cells and laterally is the uh, lamina papyracea. So the uppermost group of cells, you see this uppermost group of cells are open and they are roofed by the, this is the frontal bone, above by the frontal bone. So the roof of these uppermost cells is formed by the frontal bone known as fovea ethmoidalis. And there is the orbit, just I am not going into the detail, we have a case, live surgical, we will discuss, but some points to discuss. The details of the orbit is best appreciated on an axial CT scan. That is the important thing I wanted to mention. You can see the medial rectus muscle, lateral rectus muscle, the optic nerve and the important fact the entire length of the lamina papyracea can be uh, appreciated in detail with this axial sections and see this important fact anteriorly, this anterior posterior, this is the medial rectus, lamina papyracea and there is a pad of fat in between. So whenever you cross the limit the lamina papyracea anteriorly, you come across the fat that's a warning sign that you have entered the orbit. But this warning sign is lost behind. And the moment you damage the lamina papyracea, you are in contact with the medial rectus muscle. So you have to uh, be cautious about 
while working in the post fit mold not to damage the lamina papyracea as there is no pad of fat behind to protect you from hitting the uh, medial rectus muscle. Now, one important thing discussed many a time as a matter of fear or concern for any every endoscopic sinus surgeon is anterior model artery. It's always a big fear. So, what exactly is this and what is the fear? See, this artery can be appreciated very well in all the uh, section, the axial, coronal, sagittal, but may, you should have a thin 0.5 mm section. And the typical location of this artery, see this exits the orbit like a nipple, known as Kennedy's nipple. So, it leaves the orbit in a canal, in a bony canal and the typical site of leaving or exiting the orbit is this is the medial rectus muscle and this is the superior oblique muscle and this leaves the orbit exactly at the confluence of the medial rectus and the superior orbital, superior oblique muscle to enter the paranasal sinuses in the roof of the anterior ethmoid. This is not always, sometimes it is hidden underneath the thick bone, sometimes very very prominent. Whenever the skull base is more nematized, the chances of this artery running in the mesentery without the covering of the bone are very high. So, this leaves the orbit and typically at the junction of the ethmoidal bone and the frontal bone. So, once it leaves the orbit, it runs in the canal in the roof of the anterior ethmoid we always see during uh, sinus surgery and this leaves the roof of the ethmoid to enter the lateral lamella of the cribriform plate. See the lateral lamella to enter the olfactory fossa of the brain. So, it since it is a branch of ophthalmic artery, so it leaves the orbit, first part is intraorbital, then the sinus part through the paranasal sinuses, then the intracranial portion, it enters the cranium, then in the olfactory fossa, it runs anteriorly in the sulcus, known as ethmoidal sulcus and again comes back in the nasal cavity. See how many compartments it crosses during its course. So, orbit, paranasal sinuses, intracranial, then comes in the anterior superior part of the nose again to supply the anterior superior part of the nasal cavity and then leave the nasal cavity and come out to the dorsum of the nose underneath the nasal bones and comes out onto the dorsal surface between the nasal bone and the upper lateral cartilage. So, this is the entire course of this artery and we need to understand this to understand the complications involved with the damage to the anterior model artery. So, you can appreciate this artery very well like a canal leaving the orbit with the sinuses entry the fossa and on a axial CT scan very well you can appreciate that the crista galli so it leaves the orbit enters the olfactory fossa and then run anteriorly here it's moving the screen is moving and you can see even on a Sagittal reconstruction picture, the anterior ethmoid artery, though not very clear, but in coronal very clear. Similarly, the post ethmoidal artery, you do not generally appreciate the post ethmoidal artery very clear as the post ethmoidal skull base is very, very thick, but yes, on 0.5 mm section and sometimes when it is very prominent or in the rare situation in mesentery, you can appreciate this like leaving the orbit and entering the cranial cavity. This is the post ethmoidal artery. The only concern with this artery, I think Dr. Haldipur is going to discuss in detail in the coming lecture about the bleeding in the arteries. He has some interesting videos of the bleeding in the arteries he is going to show. Now, going further behind is the sphenoid sinus. See how complicated this sphenoid sinus is or the sphenoid bone is. The sphenoid sinus is nowadays the gateway to the endonasal skull base surgery. This is the gateway. All the anterior skull base approaches are through the sphenoid sinus. So, this sinus is uh, required to be perfectly understood the anatomy and its relationship. Dr. Pankaj Gupta he is our guest today. The guest he is a neurosurgeon. He has come. He is with us now. So, we have a lot of skull base cases and neurosurgeon with us, and I hope he is going to the tough time. Number of questions today in the live surgical session. So, this is the sphenoid sinus. If we see the anatomy, this is the proper sphenoid bone with the sinus inside. It has two wings, the greater wings, the lesser wing. Two processes. These are the pterygoid processes with two plates, the medial and lateral pterygoid plate. This is the entire sphenoid bone. 
and see the intricate anatomy of the sphenoid. Inside the sphenoid sinus, you have a carotid artery running in the lateral wall, the optic nerve running in the posterior superior wall, greater wing, lesser wing, through which uh, is the supra, superior orbital fissure, which leads to exit the second, third, fourth, sixth, V1, V2, all the nerves, and the median nerve running in the floor of the sphenoid sinus, and the optic nerve running in the medial part of the orbital, superior orbital fissure with the ophthalmic artery. So this is all, all important structures, all the tigers hidden and passing through the sphenoid bone. So we need to understand this anatomy in detail and be aware of by imaging, by CT scan or MRI while going to the any endonasal skull based procedure. You see the sphenoid sinus and our coronal CT. See, this is the prominence of the carotid artery here. This in the floor is the opening of the median now. Here, this is the lateral this is This is the median now. This is the V2, the maxillary nerve, the foramen rotundum. Carotid artery this is the clenoid process, the pneumatized. This is the optic nerve in the superior part. So, carotid artery here, optic nerve here. And there are many a times anatomical variation, sometimes descent, exposed, bulging, so many. So we need to understand before any skull based procedure this anatomy and there could be many anatomical variations like pneumatization. Sometimes it is so less pneumatized, sometimes even less than this like a pit, this is known as conchal variety. Sometimes it is moderately pneumatized and see in the less pneumatized the cella is far behind and to approach the cella you really have to drill a lot of bone. Sometimes it is approaching the pneumatization, approaching up to the cella known as cellar variety, this is conchal variety, cell variety and sometimes fully pneumatized and cella bulging into the roof of the sphenoid sinus is the most favorable one for the skull base approaches. The moment you enter the sphenoid, the cella is directly in your approach. So in, this is important to understand in skull base approaches like if you have a skull base case, the pituitary, meningioma, or craniopharyngioma or further intracranial posterior fossa tumor. If the sphenoid is not pneumatized, the case is not a suitable case for the endonasal approach and this has to be approached by some transcranial approach. Another variation, sometimes the sinus is too pneumatized. So the surrounding all structures we have seen in this line diagram are now in the walls of the sphenoid sinus. So all may be decent and you have to be more careful then. Like the median now, maxillary artery, the carotid may be decent, the optic now may be decent. This is the median now, the V2 and see the carotid and the optic now. Sometimes in variations like the optic now dehiscence, you see the right optic now is dehiscent. There is no bony covering over it here. So we need to understand in a pre-op CT scan. So while working inside the sphenoid sinus to be careful not to use any sharp instrument, debrider or sharp sucate forcep because it may be dehiscent sometimes like this. The optic nerve is bulging inside the sphenoid. D. Lange has devised the classification of the optic nerve running inside the relation to the sphenoid sinus. Type 1 according to D. Lange is the optic nerve deep in the wall of the sphenoid sinus without any major prominence even. You can just appreciate the optic nerve running with no prominence. Type 2 is optic nerve very prominent in the sphenoid sinus. You can make it mark. And type 3 is optic nerve is literally bulging in the sphenoid sinus and we have to understand this fact. What is onodi cell? This is the picture from the Stamberger's book, the onodi cell. Onodi is the situation like, see there are many lamellas in the lateral nasal wall, the anterior wall, the uncinate process, then the bulla, then the basal lamella. Anterior to basal lamella is anterithmoidal cell, behind to basal lamella is postethmoidal cells and behind the postethmoidal cells is supposed to be the sphenoid sinus. And so to open the sphenoid sinus, you have to go behind the postethmoidal cell. Or sometimes if one of the postethmoidal cell grows beyond, beyond, behind and superior to it, beyond the sphenoid sinus even like this, this optic nerve which is supposed to lie in the lateral wall of the sphenoid comes to lie in the lateral wall of the this posterior model cell and this is the real danger if you don't appreciate it beforehand and this situation where the optic nerve is coming to lie in the lateral wall of this cell 
is the onod cell so we have to be careful in this situation the moment you enter the postethmoid don't think of going through the postethmoid into the sphenoid the moment you enter the postethmoid stay medially and enter the sphenoid through the sphenoidmoidal this is this is onod situation you see this is the sphenoid sinus and see the behind the sphenoid is a cell this postethmoidal cell and through which the optic nerve is passing this is the onod nerve so optic nerve is in the lateral wall of the postethmoidal cell so this is onod situation you can appreciate in all the sections like on axial section if you find a horizontal septa in axial section this is diagnostic of onod it's very very simple this is sphenoid sinus is proper and this above cell going beyond the sphenoid over it so this is producing a horizontal septa on a coronal section so this is onod cell so once it is the optic nerve is going to come in contact with the onod and you can see on a sagittal section this cell is going beyond the sphenoid beyond the sphenoid sinus so this is onod situation in a axial also the cell going behind and now another thing is carotid artery you can see on the axial section sometimes the carotid is deep buried in the bone and you can't see the prominence even sometimes it is producing a prominence in the posterior lateral wall and sometimes you can see the exposed carotid artery the descent carotid artery bulging inside the sphenoid sinus and this is a real danger situation you need to understand on a pre op ct scan this is a rare situation but not uncommon in less than 3% situation it's you can see the internal carotid artery descent in the sphenoid sinus and the you knowing this fact one should never ever use any sharp instruments inside the sphenoid sinus according to stemberger the treatment of sinus disease is establishing ventilation and drainage for the sphenoid sinus is same open the sphenoid sinus widen the ostium don't do anything inside beside suction if you have anything polyp or disease or anything you should know the anatomy very well before and and you need to know what exactly you are doing with what instrument sometimes this the septa are not equally dividing the sphenoid sinus and one of the septa may be going to the carotid artery and this is a very important situation again the clinical relevance is this septa should not be handled forcefully if this septa needs to be removed should be dealt with a sharp cutting through cutting instrument rather than pulling with the forceps as may lead to tear in the carotid artery so knowing the onod cell and the posterior uh, the superior turbinate many approaches to the sphenoid are defined the standard transnasal the straight one go medial to the middle turbinate above the coina and you can approach the sphenoid then the lateral one is through the posterior ethmoidal cell then to the sphenoid and the most favorable nowadays is intermediate is the superior turbinate stay medial to the superior turbinate within the superior turbinate and the septum and you can easily access the sphenoid without any damage or if there is even if there is onod there is no fear you can't damage it if you stay medial to the superior turbinate and another thing in the sphenoid sinus is the inferior part there is a part of the sphenopalatine artery the posterior wall branch of the sphenopalatine known as mesoseptal branch runs in the floor of the sphenoid sinus if you widen it too much inferiorly you may damage this branch and come across the bleeding so it's not a concern you can cauterize it and deal with it but this is a very important branch for a hard heart flap two argentinian surgeons have devised the flap which has now become a work force for the skull base reconstruction any kind of skull base defect we have repaired up to 7 cm skull base defect through and through from anterior to sphenoid very well with the vascularized nasal septal flap entire nasal septum mucoperiosteum on one side can be elevated based on this artery behind known as hard heart flap and this vascularized flap can be placed for any skull base defect so this like pmmc as a work horse for head and neck surgery the nasal septal or the hard heart flap is a work horse for skull base reconstruction so now uh, i think we're coming to the end the lastly you can see on the axial section in the axial section behind as we have seen the superior orbital fissure and just one section above is the optic foramen you can see the anatomy here and the relationship of the disease to these structures and in short the nasolacrimal system see on a coronal section we have seen earlier 
on the anterior most picture where you see the agonage cell you can see the nasolacrimal sac in the duct this is the anterior most as this is the pneumatization of the agar uh, lacrimal cells so this nasolacrimal system if you see starts with the canaliculi common canaliculi and the sac and the nasolacrimal duct this has 13 walls in the entire system all these are named by the different surgeons many of them i don't know the entire 13 common we know the wall of hessner wall of boschler wall of pol wall of rosenmuller wall of telifer and all so many walls in this system and if we see this video we commonly